Heavenly Father, again, we pray that you'll be with us. We see the enemy is in, in trying to attack in every aspect, but thank you for making provision. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. And we want to begin in verse 1. Now, we know that everything in the Bible, why it had its historical application, literally in that time, that whatever was written aforetime was written for our learning, that we through patience and the comfort of the Scriptures might have hope, that all things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So there's, there's a lesson in the last days for anything you read in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 38, we find another one of those lessons. Let's pick up in verse 1 of Isaiah, the 38th chapter, and we want to notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 1. Are you there, amen? amen. Let's read verse 1. What does the Bible say in verse 1? It says, In those days was Hezekiah sick, Unto death. How was Hezekiah sick? Unto what? Yes. So here's a man of God. He's in a straight place now. He's come face to face with death. And just what Hezekiah did at that time is what you and I need to do at this time. Now somebody says, but I'm not sick unto death. But, but we are facing a crisis that's going to bring us face to face with death. What crisis is going to do that? Remember Revelation 13? It says, and he had life. I'm talking about speaking of America, the two horned beast. It says he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that they that would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Should be what? Yeah. So according to the Bible, uh, based on the issue of the image of the beast, is going to bring us face to face with what? Yeah. Death. So what Hezekiah did as he was facing death is what you and I, our families, and our church needs to do as we're approaching death. Death. Does it make sense? Yeah. All right. Let's see what he did. Isaiah 38 verse 1. And in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord. Let's read this together. Set thine house in order. So now as he was facing death, what did God tell him to do? So if we ever come to a crisis that's going to bring us face to face with death, what should we do? Set our house in order. Now, God was speaking to Hezekiah's own life, his literal life, his self. He was speaking to Hezekiah's house. Did, did Hezekiah's house go through a crisis later on? Yes. They did. And so we're going to find out that what we, you and I should be doing as we approach the final moments of earth's history. We should be saying, dear God, is my heart in house set in order? And if we're honest with ourselves, you know what we have to say? It is not. There are still some things that need to happen in my heart to get ready. There are still some things that need to happen in my home to get ready. There are still some things that need to happen in this church to get ready. But God's plan is to get us ready. I'm thankful for that. What do you say? We found out that something is happening. We put some uh, dates on the board. And you remember that we were noticing this before. Historically, we found that a crisis that's going to bring the whole world face to face with death is developing. And the historian, the, uh, the, 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 the intellect, all fields of the faith has said it. Now, we found that this crisis, they said that it may uh, uh, magnify and explode in 2030, but actually they said it, it, it has begun before 2030. When did they say it's going to begin? 2020. Now, has it begun? Yes or no? It has. Now, this historian said, why the fall of the American empire will come by 2030. We looked at this part where it says, the historian writes that all negative trends that are plaguing America now are likely to get much worse, growing rapidly by 2020 and will reach a critical mass no later than what? Now, this article was written 2017. So in 2017, he brings this out. Now, the prophet, as we read before, talked about the thinking men understanding this. Not because they understand prophecy, but because they can understand historical events. And as we look at history, we can see that what was going on creating crises in every nation, that when that began to happen in America, it projected that we would reach a crisis beginning in 2020, moving on and exploding no later than 2030. This is what the historian says. Now, also, this group, a very uh, influential group, 
came together. It's called the Geneva Center for Security Policy. That's what it says for. They've been in existence 25 years. Now, they said that, that, that they're doing something called a what? Crisis Management Conference. So they're holding this a conference in Switzerland, Geneva, and it's called Crisis Management Conference. What does that sound like? Uh, why would you need a conference on crisis management? Why would you think so? <laughs> there must be a crisis. Now, watch what they said. Now, what do they say? What do they say? Crisis what? 2030. Are we ready? Now, this is not a Bible conference. <laughs> it would be wonderful if it was. But it's not a Bible conference. It says, are we ready? Geneva, Switzerland. It says, join us. Now, the registration is closed. It, it, it's already packed for, for what's been happening. Join us for the first ever conference looking at the emerging threats that we will be facing between when? Now and what else? 2030. This conference is bringing future leaders together with world-renowned experts to highlight the complexity of the American crisis. Is that what it says? It says the highlight of, of the what? Global. Of the global crisis in what? So what is being shown us is that it's not just historians looking at what's happening in America. What is finding out is that what has happened in America is just a picture of what is going to take place what? World why? Now, does the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy tell us that such a thing will take place? Yes. It does. Now, inspiration says, are we to wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say anything concerning them? Should we wait till everything explodes and then we say, okay, now we knew that something was going to happen. Should we do that? No. It says, of what value would our words be then? Shall we wait until God's judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him what? How to avoid them. Where is our faith in the word of God? It says, must we see things foretold come to pass before we will believe what he has said? In clear, distinct rays, light has come to us, showing us that the great day of the Lord is near and at what? Even at the doors. Let us read and what else? Understand before it is. Well, I'm going to tell you this. If you wait for a crisis, it's too late. We cannot wait for a crisis to learn how to deal with a crisis. That's too late. And so my brothers and my sisters, what Hezekiah did is what you and I need to do. What did Hezekiah do? Talk to me. Set, Set thine house in order. Now, who did God intend to get the world and church ready for this crisis? Who did God intend? Seven the seven members of church. But what do we see our condition was? What do we see? We saw... Our condition was this. Here's an artist's picture of the church. Here's a machine that's now normally, when a person gets ready to die, what type of machine do they put near the bedside? Life support. The eyes are droopy. The minister recognizes he's sweating. He knows that they're at the, point of uh, the church is at the point of death. And the members of the church, they look even more critical than the, the minister, don't they? The members saying, we are in trouble. We're in trouble. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the condition that you and I are in right now. And this is why God says we face death. Set our house where? Amen. This is what has to happen to the church. This is what has to happen to our home. This is what has to happen to our We must get on our knees and say, dear God, show us what we need to do. And what we need to do is a revival reformation. That revival reformation is going to take us into an experience by God's grace that in order to do this now, watch what this says. In order to get ready and help the church and finish the work, we must understand what? The real, the real issue. issue. The real issue. I'm going to put something on the screen right now. I'm going to put something on the screen. Pass through this right now. We need to understand what the real issue is. Now, look at this for a moment. Who is that? That's an angel. And what angel is that? The first angel. That angel? Second angel. That angel? Third angel. Has God given us three angels' messages? In Revelation 14. But then, that angel. Now, the fourth angel, the Bible speaks of the fourth angel that finishes the work in Revelation 18. Another time we'll study that at this church. It's called the loud cry. It's called what? The loud cry. That is what's going to finish the work, and we'll study that in a moment. We're going to find out that the greatest evangelistic work is not going to take place right now. The greatest evangelistic work is going to take place under this angel right here, the fourth angel. Because we're going to find that we're not actually in a position 
to do what God wants us to do. The Bible says God does not now work to bring many into the church because of the condition of what? The church. That first there must come something to bring life, revival, reformation inside of us. So we're going to find out that the greatest work of evangelism is still ahead of us. Just like on the days of Pentecost. And we'll study it by God's grace. But now, in order to understand the real issue, we must understand something. The loud cry, Revelation 18. What's that say? Genesis what? 315. Daniel 814. Matthew 2414. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. You can put down there 6 through 12. I should have put 12 there. 6 through 12. Now, we're going to find out that if you do not understand what these verses mean together, you can't string those verses together and understand why they're put together, then we don't really understand what the real issue is. Not yet. Does God condemn us? Yes or no? He just wants us to understand. So what is the text again? Genesis what? 3.15. Daniel what? 8, 14. Matthew 24, 14. And Revelation 14 what? 6 through 12. Now what I want to ask for just a moment, just to whet our appetites as we get ready to study deeply into this, uh, to the real issue that we must understand to get our house in order. Now, Genesis three fifteen. What does it say? I will put what? Enmity between thee and the woman. Between thy seed and her seed, it, the seed, shall do what? Bruise the what? The serpent's head. It shall bruise thy head. Talking about the serpent. Crush his head. That's what Jesus, the picture of Jesus, as it were, uh, the, rep the representation of Jesus, stepping on the serpent's head. That's Genesis 3.15. All right. Daniel 8.14. What does Daniel 8.14 say? And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. All right. That's what the priest does when he goes into the most holy place, October 22nd, 1844. Matthew 24, 14. What does it say? And this, not any gospel. That's not what it says. It says, and this gospel. What does that mean? What, what does that mean, this? There's particular. Now, a person can say, I have a gospel. That's not what that verse is talking about. It says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached for a witness unto all, uh, shall preach unto all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So until that happens, the end can't come. Not any gospel. Somebody says, well, we're preaching the gospel all around, all around the world. I wonder if it's this gospel. Because if it's not this gospel, it does not bring on the end. It must be a particular end time gospel. And then Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12. What, what is contained in Revelation 14, 6 through 12? The three angels' message. Verse 6 says, and I saw another angel. Do what? Fly in the midst of heaven. What did he have? He had this gospel. He had the everlasting gospel, this gospel that was being talked about, to preach to every, na uh, to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and saying with a loud voice, what did he say? Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is what? Come. All right. Then it says, worship him made heaven, earth, and sea, and the fountains of war. Now, all of these verses connect with each other. If we don't understand that, we don't understand this gospel, nor do we understand what the issue is. If we do understand how they relate together, at least we have an intellectual understanding. Is that enough? The sealing is a selling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. Something must happen more than just inform our intellect with information. There has to be a change in our heart and a change in our lives that produces a change in our relationship with God. Now, I want to ask some brave soul if they would begin to try to tell me. Because, see, we, we begin to start studying this in this church, have we not? Have we been studying Genesis 3.15? Have we been studying Daniel 8.14? Have we begun to look at Matthew 24, 14? We were studying Matthew 24 and Revelation 14, 6 through 12. We've gone through somewhat of this. Now, we haven't strung it all together yet. We're putting it down like pieces of a puzzle, piece by piece. Now, does any brave soul want to try to tell me how they think that this fits together? I tell you what, I'm not going to tell you to do it now. 
We're going to study a little bit more, but I'm going to come back to a point. I'm going to test by God's grace all of us to see if we can understand how to fit together. This is the issue. In fact, let me put something on the screen. Second Selected Messages 106. Let's read this together. Second Selected Messages 106. Let's read it all together. What does the first two words say? The message. The message. Proclaim by the angel flying in the midst of what? Heaven. Now I want to ask you, who did that? Who, 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 who presented that message? Revelation, Revelation 14. Who, who presented that message? The first of the three angels' message. Am I right? right? All right. So it says the message proclaimed by the angel flying in the midst of heaven is the everlasting gospel. Now listen. The same gospel that was declared where? In Eden, when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall do what? Bruise thy head. Now, where is that found? Genesis what? Now, do you understand what that's saying? This is saying that the same gospel that was seen carried by the angel of the three angels' messages is the same gospel given in Genesis what? 3.15. Which tells me that this is the same as what? That. that. Are you following? Yes. Somebody said, well, what, what do you mean? Wait, 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 wait. I, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and it shall bruise thy head. How is that the same as fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come? Are you understanding my question? Yes. Now, if we don't understand the connection, then we don't understand this gospel. Now, if you went to the Catholic Church, and you asked the Catholic, what does this have to do with that? You know what he would tell you? Nothing. In fact, do you know that the, the Catholic position on Revelation is that everything has been fulfilled except for the coming of Jesus? That's the Catholic position on the book of Revelation. That's the Jesuit position on the book of Revelation. So th this, is already, this has already been done. There's no, no more gospel here. That's happened. Nothing else about that. And this one, oh, that, that happened many centuries ago. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you went to the Baptist and asked him, what does Genesis 3.15 have to do with Revelation 14? What would he tell you? Nothing. And if he, if, he, if, he, if he said nothing, if he didn't say nothing, he would have to tell you, if he was sincere, what would he have to tell you? I don't know. The Methodist. The Pentecostal. Church of God. Do you know the only person that has the ability, the key, to be able to look at those verses and say they fit together and begin to intelligently show you how they fit together. You know the only church that could stand up and say that? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is the issue. And we're going to find that it, this is why God has us in this church. Even if we don't understand it, God has us here so that we can what? Understand. My people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. And so right now, God has us here in a school, BTI. What's BTI? Bible Training Institute, so that we can understand this. All right. Watch what this says. Review and Herald, September 5, 1899. You can find this and lift him up. The devotional by Sister White, 373. Let's read it together. It says, we are now amid the perils of the... Is that true? Yes or no? Yes. The scenes of conflict are not slowing down in 2020. They are what? Hastening on. And the day of days is what? Just upon us. Are we prepared for the issue? We've got to understand the issue if we're going to set our house in order. If we want to get the church ready. If we want to get ready. Are we prepared for the issue? Now notice the next sentence. The what? Talk to me. The serpent's head... And wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. It says, are we prepared for the issue? And then tells me the serpent's head will soon be what? Bruised and what does that tell me? The issue is Elder Smoke Hayes. That the serpent's head must be what? Now, if you go to any other denomination and ask them about the serpent's head being bruised, you know what they will tell you? That it already happened. At the cross. Now, I want to ask you a question. Did anything happen at the cross? Yes. Did anything happen with the serpent's head at the cross? Yes. In fact, the Bible says that Golgotha, do you remember what Golgotha means? Skull. The place 
of a skull. Golgotha, that's what the word means. That's where that mountain is, where he was. It's the place of a what? At the cross, Jesus began the work of the bruising of the serpent's head. But guess what? He did not finish. But every other denomination teaches that everything finished where? At the cross. And they say what well, Jesus said, it is what? Then it had to be finished. Well, want to ask you a question. Did he ever, would he ever say it's finished again? Yes. What does that tell me then? There's more than one thing that has to be finished. Yes. Something did finish at the cross, but it wasn't the plan of redemption. What finished at the cross was his work as a lamb. But what was not finished is his work as a priest. And so when he said on the cross, remember, behold the Lamb of God. When he said on the cross, it is finished, he was saying, my work as a lamb is done. He will never have to die again. But when his work as a lamb was done, his work as a priest had just begun. He said he's Alpha and what else? Omega. As Alpha, he's Lamb. As priest, he is Omega. Alpha means beginning. Uh, uh, omega means so he began the work of redemption as a lamb, but he didn't finish the work as a lamb. The outer court is the work of the lamb. He finishes the work in the sanctuary, not as a lamb, but as a what? Priest. As a priest. And so we've got to come to understand this. It says, are we prepared for the issue? The serpent's head will soon be bruised and crushed. The glorious memorial of God's wonderful power is soon to be restored to its rightful place. What's it talking about? The Sabbath. Then paradise lost will be talked to me, paradise restored. God's plan for the redemption of man will be. Now, when it says will be, what does that tell me? It's not right now. That's still future. You ask any other denomination, they'll tell you the plan of redemption finished where? And they will say, if you don't believe that, you are not an evangelical. We better understand what the message is for ourselves. Because every one of us will be tested. And we can't say, well, that's what we believe at Seven Adventists. That, that's not good enough. You know what we need to be able to go to? The Bible. So I believe this because the Bible said it. This is the Christian position. So we're here at Bible Training Institute to understand that. All right. It says, the Son of Man will bestow upon, their, upon the righteous the crown of everlasting life. And they shall serve him how? Day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell where? So then what we need to understand is the real issue. And my brothers and my sisters, this will give way to what is called the loud cry, and this is the real issue. Someone said, I thought you said it was Genesis 3.15. I did. <laughs> well, then why are you showing me a priest? Because that has something to do with Genesis 3.15. Is that right? right? How long has he been in there? Talk to me. 177, six years. This October we, 22nd, we passed it. Something happened this October 22nd, historically, in, the, in America. We'll talk about it later on. Now, my brothers and sisters, more clearly than we do, we need to understand the what? Issues at stake in the great conflict. We've got to understand this. We've got to look back at the real issue and understand it. This tells us he desires to call their attention from the real issues to what? False theories. Satan is not sleeping. He doesn't want us to understand what the real issue is. Now, this is the real issue. Listen. If Jesus leaves the most holy place on time, Satan is in trouble. He knows it too. If Jesus leaves the most holy place on So then what is Satan's plan? We're going to talk about this again and again. Because this is the real issue. And no one else understands this but you and I. And so what is the devil doing to us? Putting us to sleep. So my question is, what is Satan trying to prevent? Somebody talk to me. He doesn't want, now you sound like a seven minutes out of smoking. He doesn't want Jesus coming out of what? Most holy place. So then what you and I have to understand is what will cause Jesus to stay in the most holy place and what will bring Jesus where? Out of the most holy place and what will he do when he comes out? When he comes out, is he going to tickle the devil? What's he going to do when he comes out? That's what we have to understand. When we put this together, then we'll understand that only one group of people can give this message. Seven day Adventists. It's a wonderful thing to be a part of the Seven Adventist Church. But I'm going to tell you something. It's not enough just to be a part of the church. We have to get the experience that God called for this church to have. And I want it. What do you say? Amen. I want my family to have it. What do you say? Amen. 
So before we go deeper in our study this morning, let's stop and pray. Let's get on our knees and say, dear God, help us as we study to understand this. Would you reverently kneel with me as we approach the Lord in prayer? Oh, Father, which art in heaven, I can sense your presence already here. Wanting to speak with us, Lord, because you love us. You care about us. And you want to bring to us in our hearts revival and reformation. And Lord, this is why Satan is trying to attack us with everything he has. He doesn't care about us or our families. He's only interested in causing a condition that will prevent you from leaving the most holy place. And Father, we want to understand today what this means. So that in our own heart and home, that we will do whatever it takes to bring you out of that most holy place. Please, dear Lord, send your Holy Spirit this morning to speak to us and to help us to understand before it is too late. We thank you, dear God. Bless us now, we pray as we study. Open our minds and hearts, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our Bibles. We want to go into, in our Bibles, we want to pick up in the book of uh, Revelation. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6. And we want to notice what the Bible says in Revelation, the 6th chapter. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. amen. We're going to Revelation chapter 6, and you must understand the great controversy that has been carried forward now for nearly 6,000 years between Christ and Satan is about to come to an end. We prove that here. We found that Satan's attack on this generation is greater than on, on, on any other because he understands that this is not the first generation. This is the what? Final. Final generation. And Satan understands. In fact, before we go to Revelation 6, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's go to 2 Peter 2. Satan understands this. He sees that trouble is brewing all around the world. And listen, do you know that by now America should have already collapsed? And the only reason why America is still afloat, has not collapsed, is for one reason. The only reason why the world has not come to an end is for one reason and one reason only, why the world has not completely fell apart and become extinct. What is the one reason why that the whole world, that America is still intact? Someone said it's because we have a Republican as a president. Is that right? No. no. Someone says, well, well, I think it's because that there was a Democrat before him. Is that right? No. You know that Mr. Obama couldn't help us? That Mr. Trump couldn't help us? That Mr. Biden can help us. And I say it reverently and respectfully to all these men. But they could not help us. They cannot solve the problems that exist. It is not a democratic problem or a Republican problem. It is not an American problem or a, a Chinese problem or an African problem. It is a worldwide problem of, uh, of ultimate proportion. And I'm going to tell you something. And no man can solve this problem. It's a human problem. The only way that this problem can be solved is by understanding the real issue. And we're going to find out the only thing that's keeping America from collapsing right now today and the world from coming to an end right now today is one thing and one thing only. And we studied it. Yes. Do you remember what it is? Yes or no? Yes. What is it? Judgment. The judgment. That's the only thing. In fact. If we're in the Bible, how can we see that from the Bible? Second Peter. Let's go there. Second Peter chapter two. We want to pick up in verse nine. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. Let's read that together. 2 Peter 2, beginning in verse 9. Are you there? Amen? Amen. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve. Now question, what does reserve mean? What does reserve mean? Reserve means to what? It means to keep back. In other words, let's say you're getting ready to go to a, uh, 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 a restaurant and you are thinking that the tables might be taken. You want to have a special day. So you call ahead to the restaurant and what do you say to the restaurant? Reserve for me what? I need you to reserve for me a table or a couple of tables. Now, if they reserve the table, if you got there and all of a sudden the tables are filled, you would say, wait a minute, wait a minute now. You didn't what? Reserve. reserve. So in order to reserve, that means to what? Keep back for something. So the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust until the what? Day of judgment to be what? 
punish. So the Bible says that there is going to be a reservation, a reserving of the unjust until a particular day. The day of what? So there's going to be a reserving until the day of judgment. In other words, nothing will be able to bring the unjust down until the day of what? Judgment. It will look like they're prospering in the world. David wondered about it. Why does it look like the wicked are prospering? It's because the, the wicked are being reserved until the day of judgment and then they will be punished. Now, my brothers and my sisters, that tells me that America is only being held afloat because of the day of judgment. She's being reserved. The world is only being reserved until the day of judgment. But when the day of judgment reaches a certain point, then America will no longer be reserved. It will collapse. The world will no longer be reserved. It will come to an end. In fact, this is true not only of earth, but you can find that this goes to even the fallen angels in heaven that have fell from heaven. They were in heaven, but they fell. Look at 2 Peter. Let's back up now and read into it. Let's look back at 2 Peter 2 and let's back up to verse 4. Would you read that for us, Sister Minnie? 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, please. So he said he, he reserved not the angels that sinned, but ca he saved not them, but cast them down to what? Hell. Hell. Continue. And delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So the Bible tells us that not only the earth and the unjust on the earth, but even the fallen angels, the fallen angels are also being preserved or reserved until the same day. What day? The day of so why have not the fallen angels, the devil, Satan and his angels, why have they not been destroyed? Why have they not been destroyed? They're being reserved until the day of? Judgment. So then we can see that they're still alive is because the day of judgment has not yet fully taken place. Now let's continue. Look at, verse, look at the next verse. Giving us examples of this. Verse 5. Continue down, Sister Minnie. And spared not the old world. Now look, so not only the angels, it's that even that old world, Talk about the flood, the, those who lived before the flood. It said that world, continue my sister. But save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. All right. So it says, look, the world was reserved until the day of judgment. They lived wickedly and wickedly until God executed them by the flood that was a type of judgment. Look at the next verse, continuing. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Now, was Sodom and Gomorrah wicked, yes or no? Yes. Did God reserve them for a time, even in their wickedness, yes. until the day of judgment, and then they were punished? Yes. The flood was that way. They didn't just start getting wicked the day the flood came. But they were reserved until the day of judgment. There was a limit each time. Limit uh, in the time of the flood, limit in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to find out there's a limit when? Today. And so the Bible says that's the case he's building when he got to verse 9. It says, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the righteous out of temptation, but to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be what? Punish. In fact, the Bible tells us that we can understand something about this day of judgment. Go to 2 Peter. What book did I say? Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. What chapter? 3. Now, did we find out that God told us that there was going to be a day in which he would judge the world? Yes or no? Did God give us the time frame of when that hour of judgment will come? Yes or no? Yes. What angel presents the announcement of the opening of the worldwide day of judgment? What angel did that? The first angel's message. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. We studied that. Now, let's go to 2 Peter 3 because God lets us see something in 2 Peter 3. Look at 2 Peter, the third chapter. And we want to pick up in 2 Peter chapter 3 and we want to begin in verse uh, 7. In verse 7, let's read verse 7 together. It says, in fact, no, no, Maya, would you read verse 7 for us, please? 2 Peter 3, verse 7. What does verse 7 say? But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store. Give me another name for kept in store. Give me another name. Reserve. Reserve. All right, watch, watch, watch the next verse. What does it say? Next word. Reserve. Reserve. Where? Again and again, we see the same lesson. What is this world that is alive right now? What is keeping her from being e eternally destroyed? What is keeping her? The day of. So what is the issue that we need to study if we want to understand the end of the world? The day of judgment. So the Bible says reserved until the day of judgment. Continue. Now look at verse eight. 
but beloved, be not ignorant of what? This one thing that one day is with the Lord as a... Now we're going to find out the idea, uh, the idea of one day being with the Lord as a what? As a thousand years has something to do with the judgment. The idea of one day being with the Lord as a, 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 a being with the Lord as a thousand years has something to do with the what? Judge. The judgment that's going to bring the world to an end. And if it doesn't, why would God stick it right there? Right. Talking about the end of the world. Right. Talking about the day of judgment. So there must be something about one day of the Lord being as a thousand years that helps us to understand that worldwide day of judgment. Now keep, keep that in your mind. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Now, this says, what would happen if God cannot bring us back to perfection, give us victory over sin on what? Time. Now, that's a serious question. Question. Does the devil understand this time frame? Yes or no? Yes. Let's go to Revelation 12. We'll, we'll come back in, th in, in thought to this. Let's go to Revelation 12. We see what is holding back the world, what's keeping America from collapsing. The end of time from taking place is the day of judgment. Does the devil understand this? He does. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12. And let's notice that the devil understands this. Revelation 12. And we want to begin in verse 12. Uh, Sister Davis, would you read that for us, please? Revelation 12 and verse 12. Let's watch and see if the devil understands this. Revelation 12, 12. So the Bible says, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Now why? Let's continue. Mm -hmm. Now does the Bible say he's guessing? Yes or no? It says he knoweth what? Have but a short time. So my question is, does the devil understand that he's working with a time frame? Yes or no? So the Bible says the devil knoweth that he hath but a what? A short time. Now, go to Matthew the 8th chapter. What book did I say? Do the rest of the demons know with the devil that they're working on a time frame? Yes or no? Yes. Go to Matthew 8. Look at Matthew the 8th chapter. We can see the Bible says he knows that he had but a short time. A short time until he's dealt with. Does he know when he's going to be dealt with? Yes or no? Yes. When is he going to be dealt with? When is he going to be dealt with? On the day of what? Judgment. Judgment. So he knows that he have but a short time. The devil knows the time. Now look at uh, uh, Matthew chapter 8. Notice what the Bible says. In Matthew 8 chapter, let's see if the, devil, uh, the devils, the demons know it. Matthew chapter 8. And Sister Kia, if you'll read this for us, please. Matthew 8, Matthew the 8th chapter, and we want to look at verse 29. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29. If you'll read that for us, please. So now these are, the, these are the demons inside of the demoniac. You remember when, when, when Jesus delivered the demoniacs, these are the demons crying out. Matthew 8, Matthew the 8th chapter. And we want to look now in Matthew the 8th chapter in verse 29. If you'll back up and read it again, please. Matthew 8, beginning in verse 29. All right. Okay, now listen, listen. Art thou come what? Now, what was the last three words that the Bible says that the demons said when they were talking to uh, uh, Christ? What was the last three words? Before the time. Now, let's analyze that. Let's analyze that. Before the what? What does that tell us? Give me some suggestions. What, what, what is that suggesting to us? All right, time of judgment, but just this, this phrase itself, the phrase itself. So it says, and it's true, it, it does talk to us about the day of judgment, it's true. But look at the phrase itself, before the time. They're saying that they do know that there is a time when you want to deal with us. They thought that they were getting ready to be dealt with right then. And they recognize there is a time. But they said that, 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 that wait a minute, this is not in time yet, yes. That Jesus has to destroy us at a certain time. All these are right. So as you look at this, this is suggesting that the demons understand that the destruction is based on a what? Time. And it's telling us that they understood 
that when Jesus came to the earth the first time, first time it was not yet what? Time. time for their destruction. Now I want to ask you a question. About how much time had passed off of human history when Jesus came on the scene the first time? So about what? About 4,000 years had taken place and the demons at about 4,000 years says, wait a minute, it's not what? Time. How did they know that? What were they looking for? What time? What, what, what was on their mind? Because the Bible says the devil knoweth that he had but a short what? Time. They said, you come before the time. They're not time yet. You can't do that. God said, I'm not, don't be afraid. <laughs> I'm not dealing with you right now. Don't be afraid. See, everything has to happen on what? To everything, there's a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1. So my brothers and my sisters, as we look at this, the plan of redemption has to be happened just like this. In fact, do you know that the Bible teaches that if the plan of redemption does not happen on time, that the whole plan is null and void. You know what the word null and void means? We say, we say? It's done away with. In other words, it's no good. Do we know anything? Is anything like that in this life? Yes or no? Anything like that in this life? Have you ever read something where it says redeemable? You can, uh, like a, a product, a, you purchase something and it says a coupon redeemable for two months, 30 days. Now what happens if you come three months later and try to redeem it? You know what they say to you? Too late. <laughs> now think about the name. Redeemable. You know, the Bible teaches that if God does not finish the plan of redemption on time, that it will be too late to redeem us. It has to happen on time, and the devil knows this. And so the devil is trying to prevent us from getting in position on time. So my brothers and my sisters, let's read this. Volume 1, 263, it says, What shall I say to arouse or wake up the remnant people of God? I was shown that dreadful scenes are before us. Satan and his angels are bringing all their powers to bear upon what? God's people. He, Satan, knows that if they sleep, how? A little longer. What is that suggesting? That's suggesting what? Time. If they sleep a little longer, he is sure of them, for their destruction is what? He said, look, if I can just hold them just a little bit longer, I can make sure they're lost and not saved, because redemption has to happen on time. And so Satan, looking at the plan, began to develop a game plan. Satan began to develop a game plan. As he watched the plan of redemption, Satan himself came up with a game plan. What was Satan's game plan? Talk to me. Satan's game plan is, look, Satan's game plan is this. He said, I got to study the sanctuary. See, everything God's going to do is lay out in the sanctuary. The Bible says, thy will, God, is in the sanctuary. Psalm 77, 13. It says, until I went to the sanctuary of God, then understood I there in. So if I'm going to understand how all this lays out, I've got to stay at that sanctuary. How many places? Three. What are the three places? Outer court. What else? Holy place. What else? Most holy place. Now, everything God's going to do is laid out in that plan, taking us from the outer court all the way to the most holy place. At the very end of that plan, Jesus goes into the what? Most holy place on one day, only one day. What's the name of that day? The day of atonement. What's he there for? To cleanse the sanctuary. And he stays there until the sanctuary is cleansed. That's right. But guess what? He's watching a clock. Have you ever did something that was on a clock? You're doing something, you have to do it by a particular time. Jesus has to cleanse the sanctuary by a particular time or it doesn't make sense for him to clean anymore. The whole plan will be null and void, forfeited. Satan understands this. If Jesus comes down to the most holy place, what happens? Talk to me. What happens? It's over. It's over. How is it over? What, what happens? I, I want to know what happens. Sister, uh, Sister Debbie? Satan's head will be what? If Jesus comes out of the most holy place with, cleansed, with the cleansed sanctuary, he will be able to put his hands on the head of that scapegoat. Not on the tail of the scapegoat, on the what? Why? Representing now the finishing work of bruising and crushing the serpent's head. This is Daniel 8, 14. This is what has to happen at the end of Daniel 8, 14 on the Day of Atonement. Now, is it the hand of the priest that crushes the serpent's head? No. What is it? The sins. The sins. This is the issue. So Jesus has to take sin from his people. How much sin? 
All of it. Is that the picture of the Day of Atonement? Yes. That's the gospel. To get every sin. Behold the Lamb of God that does what? Taketh away the sin of the world. This is the mission of the Messiah. So my brothers and my sisters, Satan understands, wait a minute, if those sins are placed upon my head, my head will be bruised and crushed. Why? The wages of the hands are, is death. The Bible says the wages of what? Sin is death. What was put on the lamb to kill him? Sin. It wasn't the hands of the Roman soldiers. It wasn't our hands. Before Jesus had ever been touched, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto yes. death. It was sin that broke the heart of the infinite God on the, on the cross. Whose sin? sin? Your sin and my sin. Now, my brothers and my sisters, unless that sin can be taken from us and put on the head of Satan, Satan's head will not be what? He says, if I can keep them in sin, then they can't use it to crush my what? Head. And so he'll want us to hold on to some little sin. Pride. Selfishness. Anger. Every wrong word, thought, or act. He doesn't care what it is. What is Satan's game plan? Run the clock. Keep Jesus in that sanctuary until the, the clock is what? If you watch any game, football, basketball, the person who's up, if they up and they're not the best team and they recognize we shouldn't be up, you know what they do? They say, look, we're not trying to do anything else. Let's just hold the clock. Let's get out of our hands. They run the clock. Look at Satan's plan. Page 1 and Proverbs 66. Watch now. Let's read together. It says, when Satan heard that enmity, Genesis 3, 15, should exist between himself and the, and between her seed, his seed and he knew that, the, that his work of depraving human nature would be what? So Satan was listening in Genesis 3.15, trying to get any piece of information he could to understand how to develop a plan to overcome Jesus. Watch. That by some means, man would be enabled to do what? Resist his power instead of being controlled and dominated by sin. Yet as the plan of salvation was more fully what? Satan rejoiced with his angels. Now watch, does you know what this is telling me? That Satan didn't understand the plan until it was what? Unfolded. The plan was kept secret since the foundation of the world and was only made known in Genesis 3.15. That's the first time it was hinted at. Now it says Satan rejoiced with his angels that having caused man's what? Fall. Now how do you get man to fall? By making him keep the commandments of God? How do you make man fall? By making him transgress in sin. So it says having caused man's fall, he rejoiced that he could bring down the what? Son of God from his exalted position. How, how did he bring the Son of God down? What did Jesus do? When, how did he get brought down? At least as Satan presented it. God didn't be brought down. He came down. But, but how, how did it happen? What, 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 why did the Son of God come down? Because um, man sinned. Yes. And so man lost dominion of earth. Yes. So that's right. Not, not very good. Thank you. But, but how? Tell, tell, me, tell me a little more. Shit. Um, I have started us off. He, he came as a human being. He had to come as a human being. Why? So he can feel our sin. So he can feel our sin. I, he can feel what we went through. Our, our temptations. Good. All right. Some more. So he can live a victorious life and then what? And then die. How? In man's place as a substitute. That was the work of the Lamb. And so Satan said, look, I took him down from me on the throne of God, and now he came as a humble man. Look, he's in a manger he was born. Look, he's a carpenter's son. Look, look, look at him. He's now no longer, remember, when he was in heaven, I hated it. I wanted his throne, but now he's off the throne. Yeah. Guess what he made it appear? That his plan was working. It says, he declared that his plans had what? Thus far been what? Now, if he declares that his plans, that means that Satan has a plan. He can't say his plans remain successful thus far unless he had a what? He's not just fighting. He has a plan. Some of you make Satan, he's just, he's just throwing, just trying to kill everybody. No, no, no. It says Satan has a plan of trying to defeat the plan of God. He declared that his plans had thus far been successful upon the earth. That means up until 4,000 years, it appeared 
Like Satan was what? Amen. Successful. Like he's winning. And that when Christ should take upon himself what? He also might be what? He said, look, I, when Adam was in human, in human flesh, what did I do to the first Adam? I made him fall. When Jesus takes on the same, uh, the sinful flesh after Adam, the second Adam, I'm going to do to him what I did to the first Adam. He said, I have a better chance because the first Adam has sinless flesh. But the Adam, second Adam had a weakened flesh for nearly 4,000 years of degeneration. It says... And that when Christ should take upon himself human nature, he also might be overcome and thus, no, watch his plan. Thus the plan of the fallen, the plan, excuse me, thus the redemption of the fallen race might be what? Prevented. So tell me what is really Satan's game plan. This, Sister Davis, to prevent what? From being fulfilled or completed. So Satan's plan is to counterwork the plan of God. I've got to stop him from whatever he's doing. I've got to stop him from doing it. And if I can stop him, it would prevent the plan of redemption from being successful. Are we following? Yes. So that means, what did he have to understand in order to try to stop the plan? He had to understand the plan. So then what did Satan have to study in order to try to stop the plan of redemption? The plan of redemption. He had to study the plan of redemption. Where did, was the plan of redemption laid out? So then what was Satan starting to study? The sanctuary. And guess what he found out? There are only... That's what he found out. <laughs> what did he find out, Sister Davis? There are only what? So then in his plan, what does he have in his plan? I have three great opportunities to stop the plan of redemption. Hey, go, go, go. <laughs> Sister Davis, I saw a plan. <laughs> First, first place, out of court. Work of the Lamb. That's the work of the Lamb. Second place, what? Holy place. That's the work of the priest. Third place, most holy place. That's the work of the priest. Here he begins his work as a priest. Here he finishes his work as a priest. So Satan sees the plan. He looks at it and says, I've got to stop him from being a successful lamb. So what did he do when Jesus came to earth? Remember from Genesis 3.15, he tried to stop all the seeds. Every time a seed came, he tried to annihilate the entire seed. Do you remember what happened when, in Moses' time? What, what, what did the Pharaoh try to do? Wipe out how much? All of the seed. This is what this was really about. Do you remember in the time of Esther when, 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 when Haman tried to wipe out all the Jewish nation? It wasn't really for Mordecai. Satan's real plan was to destroy a people by which the seed could come. He's trying to stop it. So my brothers and my sisters, he said, look, because if the seed can never be born, it can never die or on the words of life. And that's why you go to Revelation 12. It says that the, the dragon was trying to devour the woman and her baby as soon as it was what? Born. He was trying to stop Jesus from ever come, uh, being born. And when Jesus was born, did he try to kill Jesus the moment he was at his birth? You remember that old wicked uh, Herod, Herod? Wicked Herod. All of a sudden they said the wise men came from the east. They said, look, we've seen the prophecies. The seven Adventist churches are not studying, but we've seen it. And we're coming. We got their prophets. They were reading. Great controversy. They were reading uh, 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 all these books, and they had it because, and you go back in our history and numbers, you will see that, 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 that uh, one of the false heathen prophets had prophesied. God took over uh, 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 Balaam, who at one time was a true prophet, and that preserved the text that there was going to come a Messiah. If you read it in Numbers, it talks about a star will come. Now, my brothers and sisters, they had studied this, and they now look for it. And they came to Jerusalem to get a better understanding of the plan. But when they came to the seven, uh, when they came to the Jewish nation, what happened? They were disappointed. The Jewish nation didn't even understand. Mm -hmm. The priests, Messiah, now we know the prophets, the, the, the says Messiah is coming, but Messiah here now, today? No. And so they didn't even know it. They, but, but, so they said, well, what does the prophet say? Herod said, Herod thought they were so ignorant. You know what Herod thought? Herod, because they were so ignorant of what they were supposed to know, Herod thought that they were having a plot against him. Wow. He said, they, they, I know they know more than that. <laughs> you know? And so he thought they was hiding a plot. So then they said, well, don't you have any prophecy? And finally one of the scribes came out and said, well, it does say in Bethlehem of Judea, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem and the fullness of time. Now, my brothers and my sisters, when they left, you remember what happened? He said, I want to worship him too. Did he really want to worship him? He says, so when you find him, let me, let me know. 
And I too will come down and worship him. But God spoke to those wise men. They were truly wise. And when God spoke to him, he said, look, that's a fake man. Go another way. God will direct us. He went another way. Uh, the wise men. And when they went the other way, you remember what happened? Remember? Went another way. All of a sudden, Herod was waiting for two years. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? That? He's like, now those wise men, they, they're really searching. You know? <laughs> they're searching high and low. After a couple years had passed by, Sister Teresa, I think he said, I think that they, they have tricked me. <laughs> they, they maneuvered on me. They, 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 they snowed me over. And so, so at that time, he then sets a decree to kill. They were brought face to face death. He was trying to destroy every seed. Why? He doesn't want, not, not, not Herod. It wasn't really Herod. It was the dragon, Satan. He doesn't want the lamb to be what? But too late, the Messiah was born. And once he was born, he was a punished track. Everywhere he moved, he tried to kill the Messiah. Before he ever became a man, he tried to kill him long before that. When he was 12, he, he was hoping to get lost, separated, and then boom, kill him. And that's why when Mary and Joseph lost him, that it was such a serious thing. They said, oh no, did Satan get him this time? The trust that we were entrusted with. We've got to be careful what God puts in our hands, not to let it lose. Our husbands, our wives, our children, our families, our church, this message. Now, at that time, he recognized it, but the point is that Satan was trying to stop this. Are you following me? Yes. Could he stop him? No. Every weapon in hell was used, but Jesus came off victorious. Amen. And when he got on the cross in 31 AD, one time, okay. his last three words on the cross was what? It, it is, is finished. He said, look, Satan, you can't stop me here. Check. I finished it. Satan is not like us. He's not evangelical. Satan knows it's not over. <laughs> Satan still has what? Three strikes and you're out. Isn't that baseball? Three strikes and you're out. So then in 31 AD, he finishes the work as a lamb and then he gets up in the resurrection and 40 days later, 50 days later, he goes into the what? Holy place, Holy place. to begin his work as what? Priest. Satan tries to stop this. Now, we don't have time. Now, another, another study will actually go into more of the details of what he actually did because, see, this is the reason why the Roman Catholic Church was brought into existence. Now, remember, the great goal of the Roman Catholic Church, think about it now. The whole goal is Satan is trying to stop Christ's work, not now as a lamb, but as a what? Priest. So a church was developed that have a what? Priest. Priest. Not in heaven, but where? On earth. So now if you have a priest on earth, what would that do? If you, if you think that the priest on earth is really the priest you to go to, what would that do? You give, me a, give me a name. Think about that. Prevent. If you go to the priest on earth, it will prevent you from going to the priest where? Whoever liveth to make intercession. Who can save. The priest can save to the? If we come to him. And so Satan's whole goal is to prevent us from coming to who? To Jesus, the priest. To prevent us from coming to Jesus. See, it doesn't matter how bad the sinner is. If the sinner can get to the priest, he can be saved. He can save us to the uttermost, those who come. Hebrews 7, 25. So my brothers and sisters, Satan's game plan now, I can't stop the lamb. But if I can make a priesthood on the earth, I can prevent the world from going to the priest in heaven and thus I can prevent phase two of the plan of redemption. Do we see this? Yes. And so he set up an earthly sanctuary, an earthly priest, an earthly confessional. This is not Christ. This is Antichrist. Someone in the place of Christ. And he did a job. In fact, he attacked this so much through this system that there was created in history something called the what? Dark Ages. Bibles were burned. The church had to go into the wilderness underground. The people of God were hunted, killed, brutalized, murdered until a message came to bring us back to the Bible in the Protestant Reformation. And do you know what the power of the Protestant Reformation was? That we don't have to go to earthly men for salvation. Amen. That Luther, the power of Luther was not, Luther's goal was not to attack the papacy. 
That, that was almost a byproduct. Luther's goal was to show the beauty of the man. The beauty of the plan reveals the beauty of the man. And he's trying to say Luther hated God for a while. He thought God was a God of nothing but justice and, and, and judgment and punishment and execution. And he hated God. But then he had got to a Bible that was chained in the convent. Only one Bible in all that uh, uh, cloister and all that uh, uh, convent. And he goes to the Bible and the Holy Spirit moved upon him to read it. And he began to read it. But guess what he found when he read the Bible? This God is different. You know what he said? God cares about me. He loves me. He said, yes, I'm a sinner. He doesn't he does compromise, but he died. He, he died for me so he could be just. He is just. And that's beautiful. But he's merciful. He's loving. He's kind. He's compassionate. And as he read this, Luther rose up in holy zeal. Maybe people don't know this. And so he began to start teaching with love the beauty of God, the plan of redemption, the priest with the light that he had. And all of a sudden, the Roman Catholic Church system, the Pope of Rome got a win of what was going on. You know what happened? There was something called indulgences. What? And they would sell indulgences. What was happening was that they had made it up, nothing from the Bible, but they had made up the idea because the, they said the priest can forgive sin, earthly priests, that if you paid a certain amount of money, even before you sin, Brother Bill, they said you could sin and then you can buy a forgiveness of sin before you ever sin. It was practicing and prospering, according to Daniel 8, 13 and 14. Cast the stranger to the ground. Now, so when, 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 he, when, he, when he started doing that, he came, he came across all through his, his place. First, in Germany, everything was being cleaned up. The drunkards were putting down the, 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 their drinking. The, the alcohol, the, 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 the smoker putting down his, his cigarettes, as it were. The, the lifestyles were being turned to God. And all of a sudden, this sale of indulgences came. And people start buying forgiveness before they ever sin, giving them free reign to what? Sin. He, he, ran, he ran across one of his members, the man drunk on the ground. Sin, you could, you could smell the sin in his life. And Luther, I thought you'd come back to God. And the man fumbles up. Oh, it's all right, Luther, you don't have to be upset. It's all right. He said, I've already been forgiven. Look at my pocket. He pulls out of his pocket an indulgence that was signed by the Pope of Rome. You paid, your forgiveness is already accepted. You can go to any priest and they must accept this and accept you back into the church. Luther looked. He was upset now. You know why? Because it was shadowing the beauty of the man, the beauty of the plan. He says, I will make sure that a little child will know more of the gospel than any priest. This is Protestantism. Not putting your faith in a man or a minister or a priest, but putting your faith in God and his word. And so Luther began to preach with holy zeal. So much so that the triple might of the Pope jostled off his head. You know, you stand, you stand on top. He's preaching so hard. Boom, 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 boom. His, 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 his crown falling off. I'm going to tell you something. What really got the attention of the Pope, the Pope said, I don't care about no German uh, priest, no name priest. And they said, no, 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 sir. You, I think you need to pay attention to this German. And they said, what do you mean? Because the German is one of the main places where they made money. And they were selling the indulgence. They made a lot of money that way. And all of a sudden, the man said, he didn't care about the, the doctrine at the time, but he looked, he said, look, he showed him the treasury. He said, this is, was the amount of money that Rome was making before Luther began preaching. This is the amount of money they're making now after he started preaching. He said, let us kill this monk. Let's kill this monk. <laughs> what got him to speak? The love of money is the root. We're going to see this in the market of the beast. I'm going to tell you something. You know why people want to open the country more than the pandemic and the disease? You know what it's for? The love of money. 
I mean, man was, was on one television station. I would leave the station nameless. I, I, would, I would leave the station nameless. But one television station, the man said, look, he tried to get all of the grandparents to say, look, we don't care if we die as long as we open up the economy. He tried to get all the grandparents to say that. And the grandparents said, look, some grandparents said, look, you, you can die. I'm not dying. <laughs> you may die, but not me. He said, look, I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat. I, I want life. You know? but, but, but this money will speak to us. Now, my brothers and my sisters, Satan is trying to stop him. Was he successful in stopping too? It looked like during the dark ages, but when Luther came back on the scene, directing the eye that just shall live by what? Faith. Come to Jesus. You don't need a priest on earth. And at that time, he, they brought back to Jesus and the Protestant Reformation took off like wildfire. Jesus was successful in the holy place. October 22nd, 1844. Jesus finished his work in the holy place. And guess what he did? He moved. What does Satan know right now? No more places. This is it. Now, if you're in the army and you're fighting and you back up, you, you, you retreat, you retreat, you retreat, you retreat, you retreat. And then finally, there's no more retreating. You know what they call that? The last stand. The last stand. And if you're a warrior, now if you're, if you're a chump or a, 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 a nobody, you just capitulate and you, you just give in. But not a warrior. You know what the warrior says? To the death. In Greece, there, 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 there was a fight like this when it was between Greece and, and Rome. And Rome was getting ready to take on the scene. And see, it's too late. Greece was a, a terrible warrior group. And Alexander the Great, it was almost unbeatable. Crushed everybody in sight. But prophecy said that Rome was going to take over Greece. So when, 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 when they were fighting Alexander's men, they were warrior battle. They, they wanted to fight to the death. There was only about, uh, it was a few hundred men compared to thousands. And those, they were the elite of, uh, uh, of Greece. You know what they said? Some others who were just regular foot soldiers, they turned and retreated and, and fl flow. What do we call it when you, when you retreat? Uh, I forget the name. But they, they turned and retreated and, 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 and fled. I forget what the, the name is, a specific name. But they, they fled. When they fled, they, they escaped for their lives. But the elite, you know what they said? They said, no, sir, we're going to fight to the death. And they fought to the death and they died. Now, the devil is a warrior, satanically, but he's a warrior. He wants to fight to the, he will not give up. And so Satan now says, I, I have my last chance. How much do you think he's going to throw at us? Everything. Don't think that you want to make it easy in this life. This, the fiery trials that we must go through is because the devil is going to give everything he has to make sure his head is not crushed. He's going to attack our families like nothing. He's going to give everything he has. He's going to attack marriages. He's going to attack homes. He's going to attack the church. He's going to attack everything he can to stop us. But you must say, if you're a warrior, I will not what? Give up. I cannot capitulate. I've got to stand for Jesus. Now, my brothers and my sisters, Satan's plan is to prevent the Day of Atonement from coming to a what? Now, why does he not want the Day of Atonement to come to an end? Talk to me somebody quickly. Why does he not want the Day of Atonement to come to an end? This is last one. If he fails here, what's going to happen? Jesus is not going to know the room. Jesus is going to come out of that most holy place and he's going to do what? Talk to me. Crush Satan's head. Symbolized by the priest putting his hand on the head of the scapegoat. Now what's going to literally happen to, the, uh, to, to Satan? Go to Ezekiel. What book did I say? When that priest comes out, he's going to put his, go to Ezekiel 28. When that priest comes out, he's going to put his hand on the head of the scapegoat. It's going to be a symbolizing of the crushing of Satan's head by the transfer of sin. The wages of sin is death. What's really going to happen? Now, we're not, we, that was symbolic. Genesis 3.15, symbolic. Serpent, symbolic. The, the crushing of the head, symbolic. The priest, symbolic. But Ezekiel 28, not symbolic. Ezekiel 28 is going to show you in, in literal time what's going to happen. Let's see. How is he going, his head going to be crushed? What, what's going to be the final result? Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, Sister Chanel, if you read this for us, please. Ezekiel 28, beginning in verse 14. Ezekiel 28, verse 14. What does the Bible say, please? Ezekiel 28, verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that now, who, who was the anointed cherub that covereth? That was Lucifer. Now, go to verse 15. So, Satan was perfect until iniquity was what? Found in him. Now, I want to ask you a question. What's going to happen to him once iniquity was found? What happened? Jump down to verse 17. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Thou hast made thy heart 
I will cast thee to the what? Ground. Ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may be Sister Parker, would you pick up in verse 18, please? Where? He said, because you have brought iniquity and passed and traffic, sold this iniquity to all the people. He says, now I'm going to have to deal with you with punishment and judgment. I'm going to bring fire from the midst of thee. Continue. So what's he going to do to Satan? He's going to bring him to ashes where? Upon the earth. He's going to burn him up. Continue. Now watch verse 19. Verse 19, Mother, Mother Davis, would you read that? Verse 19, please. Now they said they're going to be what? Astonished, surprised. I can't believe this has happened. He's been around for so long causing havoc and trouble. But watch them, they keep, keep reading. It says, thou shalt be a terror. You, in other words, you would terrorize the people. Now I'm going, to make, I'm going to terrorize you. Thou shalt be a terror and what? And Never shalt thou be aware. Anymore. So what's going to happen to Satan? He's going to be destroyed. Fire's going to burn him up. He's going to turn to ashes upon the earth. And never shall he be what? Anymore. How long will he exist? Not at all. When will he come back? Never. So he's going to be gone forever and ever and ever and ever and Satan is looking at this saying I cannot let this happen I've got to stop this he's failed and now the court he failed in the holy place now in his final chance and the most holy place and his only plan is prevent the day of atonement from coming to an end because at the end of the day of atonement the priest comes where out of the most holy place now this plan has been operation how long has the plan been going on six thousand years the plan is laid out 6,000 years, this plan has been going on. Nearly 6,000 years in 2020. Now, look what this is. One year of the same church represents the whole plan of redemption. 6,000 years. Now, watch. The 6,000 years takes us from the outer court all the way into the what? Most holy place. And the 6,000 years finishes at the Day of Atonement. Now, in fact, in other words, the Day of Atonement, which is what feast? What number is the feast of the Day of Atonement? In the sanctuary, there's seven feasts. Because remember, God does everything in. Seven. And the seven feasts takes us to heaven. You'll notice that all these feasts are here are in white, but right here, this one is colored yellow. Why is that a different color than all the rest? That's the last. And it doesn't happen on earth. It happens, guess where? In heaven. So my brothers and sisters, all the six feasts happen on earth. Those feasts have to happen on time. Now, that tells me now, what is the sixth feast? The day of? Did it start on time? What was the time? Until 2,300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be, and it was cleansed on the day of atonement, which was the sixth feast. It started on time. But in order for the seventh feast to start on time, the sixth feast must end on time. Now, my brother and sister, that means that the day of atonement can't just go forever. The day of atonement has to not only begin on time, it has to what? End on time. And if it doesn't end on time, the whole plan is null and void. Man will become irredeemable because the time of his purchase and carrying out of the plan has what? Passed. Are we together? Yes. All right, let's go a little further. Now, my brothers and sisters, here's that plan laid out. Let's read it together. It says, a noise, great controversy, 656, a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. For how long? Now, remember... The day of judgment, remember it says that days with the Lord as a, and that there's something about that thousand years that has to do with the day of judgment. Now, when God made man, how much time did God give man? Talk to me. Six days. You remember? Every week we get this. Six days for work, one day for rest. And it's repeated every, every week. Six days for work. One day's for rest. You know the fourth commandment. What does it say? Let's say it together. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou do labor and do all thy work. So all of our work has to be done in what? 
six days. Now, do you know that when Satan is looking at this, he's recognizing something. And when he looks at the seven days and he sees that, he recognized that man was made in the image of God. And he understands the principle that a day is with the Lord as a what? God. And so he's looking at it. Uh, so if man is made in the image of God and man has six days to do all his work and one day to rest, he says, well, the, if the Lord a day is with as a what? A thousand years. Then God is telling us that he's going to do all of his work of redemption on earth in how long? Six, six thousand years. years. And the day of judgment will be in session. And then there will be 1,000 years to rest. Does the Bible speak of 1,000 years to rest in heaven? Yes. Revelation chapter 20. Mm -hmm. And then 6,000 plus 1,000 equals what? 7, God finishes everything in sevens. This is, this is why we're seven heaven us. The church that's going to make this plan unfolded. And then he finishes everything. When he comes down to the end of 7,000 years, what's going to happen? Ezekiel 28. The crushing of the head. The fire. And never shalt thou be what? Any more. It says, for 6,000 years, the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and His heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. Then it says, now all have made their what? When? At the end of what? 6,000 years. The wicked have fully united with Satan in his warfare against God. The time has come. So at the end of 6,000 years, the time in heaven's sanctuary has come for something. Now you know now we've been studying this. What has the time come for at the end of 6,000 years? Talk to me in the plan. What does the time come for? For the priests. Some, talk, talk to me. For the what? For the priests to come out of the most holy place so that the day of atonement can end on time. Now, my brothers and sisters, the time has come. 6,000 years. All have made their decisions. The time has come. Now, the event takes place foreshadowed in the last solemn service of the what? Day of atonement. It quotes Leviticus 16. And as the scapegoat was sent away into a land not inhabited, so Satan will be banished to the desolate earth and uninhabited and dreary wilderness. The revelator foretells the banishment of Satan and the condition of chaos and desolation. We'll come back and study this a little bit more because there's more to it. To which the earth is to be reduced and he declares that this condition will exist how long? Four thousand years. Six thousand takes us to the end of the day of atonement. Jesus comes back for a thousand years. He takes us to heaven. Satan is on this earth for a thousand years in the desolate wilderness. And after the end of a thousand years, 6,000 plus 1,000 equals 7,000, the history of redemption comes to an end. The sin is put upon the head of the scapegoat. This is the plan. Satan studied the plan. Guess what Satan says? I've got to stop because he fell here, here. The only thing left now is for Jesus to finish his work here and come what? Out. Satan says, I've got to stop it. Prophet says, in like manner, the types which relate to the what? Second advent must be fulfilled at the... Point it out in some like service. It has to happen on. Now, brothers and sisters, without going through a deep calculation, you have to understand if Jesus died on the cross in 31 AD. About how much time it passed off? About what? So in 31 AD, about 4,000 years had already transpired. Not exact, but about. Now, if that is so in 31 AD, then if I, how much time would be left for 6,000 if I had 4,000? How much time would be left? So if I add 2,000 to 31 AD, what do I get? So that tells me that 2031 would be about what? 6,000. It could be a little bit more or a little bit what? So what this is telling me is, you see the crisis that we wrote down on the board between 2020 and what? 2030. Is that not about right? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Now my brothers and sisters, this tells me that we're in that time right now. And though we don't know the day and the hour, we know that this generation shall not pass. Now, my brothers and sisters, that tells me something. What is the greatest evidence? Because 2020 is no what? Ordinary year. It makes sense of why the fall of the American Empire will come by what? It makes sense of why? Because it's showing us it has to be. If it's not exact this time, it's going to be a little bit before that. And a miracle if it's a little bit after that. Are you following me? In the natural order, things should be gone already. This is why it says, but rapidly by 2020, we are approaching the limit that God has set up from the very beginning of time. And God has made it possible for us to understand this. And guess what? If that limit is almost ready, do we need to get ready? Yes or no? Yes. Do you want to bring Christ out of the most holy place on time? Yes. Because if Satan wins, we're all in trouble. So my brothers and sisters, in the shadow, what does it take to happen on time? What does Jesus have to do on time in the shadow? He can't just come out. I don't know. Now, I'll let, let you get away with that first because we want to lay a foundation. 
But now we're here. Something has to happen inside of the church in order for Jesus to come out of the most holy place. He's not just sitting there twiddling his thumbs. You know, some people say, oh, some people say, wow, this is what has made some evangelicals not believe. They say, in 1844, if Jesus went to the most holy place to begin the work of the investigative what? Judgment. And start it with the dead. But at the end of the day, they told me he must move to the living. They say, 1844 to 2020, that's 176 years. You mean to tell me it takes God 176 years to judge? No. It didn't take God 176 years to judge. You know what's happening? Yes. Have you ever been doing something and you could have finished something, but you're waiting on somebody? Right. Maybe you're eating your food and you're supposed to be meeting an appointment with somebody and they're late. You ever did that before? Yeah. And if you're eating, what do you do with your food? You slow down, take a little bit slower bite. Does it take you that long to finish the food? No. What are you doing? You're slowing down, hoping that somebody will get there on before it's too late. Jesus went into the most holy place. He could have finished the work and cut it short and come back. But there's a limit beyond which he cannot go beyond. And so Jesus, and 160 years later, he's looking. He wishes he could come back. But he says, if I, come, if I go to the judgment of the living right now.